Uh, thanks everyone for coming to this um, this online seminar. So this is the the second week we've been doing this, and uh, we think it'd be a great thing if we can keep it going. So um, yeah, welcome. Thanks for coming. Just to let you know, this is being recorded, and we're going to put it on YouTube. So you know, if you if you ask a question, that's encouraged. But um, yeah, you may you'll you'll be on the internet. So. Fair warning. Um, uh, please do ask questions. So uh, I think everyone's muted by default, but you can probably unmute yourself and, and ask a question if you want, or you can use the hand raising function, or you can use the chat. And um, if you do one of those, then one of the hosts will try to, to flag you up and give you a chance to ask a question. Um, Okay, so then without further ado, I'm happy to welcome Kanan Sandar Rajan from Stanford, who's going to talk to us about equidistribution for the Chinese remainder theorem. Thank you very much. Uh, good. Hello, all. I was going to say good morning, but I don't know what time it is where you are. So uh, thank you for coming. So I'm going to talk about work that I've been doing with uh, Emmanuel Kowalski while I was on sabbatical in uh, ETH uh, uh, earlier this year. Uh, so we were trying to figure out something related to work of Hooley on uh, roots of a polynomial congruent, on roots of polynomial congruences. And then we ended up realizing that this is a very general feature about uh, how the Chinese remainder theorem ends up mixing things. So that's what I want to explain a bit today. So let me begin by saying, uh, recalling a very beautiful theorem, which is due to Duke Friedlander and Ivaniet. Uh, it's one of the great uh, achievements in the late uh, 90s. Uh, if you look at the roots of, uh, of the congruence, n squared plus one is congruent to zero mod p. So if p is one mod four, you get two solutions to this. And if p is uh, three mod four, you get no solutions. And if you take those two roots mod p uh, and you take all the primes p as well up to some point x. So for each prime that's one mod four, you get two roots. So you get approximately the number of primes up to x number of roots in this set. And that, that set of points mod one gets equidistributed as x gets large. So this, uh, this is the theorem of Duke, Friedland, and Ivaniets. They proved it for all irreducible quadratics where uh, the discriminant is negative, I think, and then Toth proved it when the discriminant is positive as well. So, so we now know that this is true for any irreducible quadratic polynomial. If you take its roots modulo primes, those get equidistributed. Now you can ask uh, the same question for polynomials of higher degree. And this is a very beautiful open problem. And I would love to be able to say anything about it, but nobody knows anything uh, for cubic polynomials or higher. Instead, if you, don't want to get equidistribution of roots modulo a prime, and you want to get equidistribution of roots modulo a composite modulus, or just any modulus Q, then there's a very general theorem, which is due to Hooley, uh, which precedes the Duke Freeland and Ivanias uh, work by maybe 25 years or so. It's an old theorem. It says that if you take any irreducible polynomial of degree at least two, uh, it actually doesn't have to be even irreducible, but let's just say irreducible polynomial of degree at least two, and if you look at its roots modulo Q, there are a few ways in which you can set up, set up this problem. Uh, what Hooley does is to look at all the roots modulo Q, take the fractions nu over Q, where nu runs over the roots, and then to take all the moduli Q going up to some point X. And you look at this big set, and this set gets equidistributed modulo one. So for example, for quadratic polynomials, you'd be looking at all numbers that are sums of two squares, and then looking at the roots of x squared plus one is zero modulo q, which is the sum of two squares. And then if q is very composite, then you would get lots of roots. And then you put all those roots together and you get equidistribution. Okay. Now, what's going on here is that if you look at the roots of a polynomial congruence mod q, well, those roots mod q are built out of the roots modulo a prime power and you use the Chinese remainder theorem. So you take the roots modulo p to the v for every uh, prime power p to the v that exactly divides q, and then you form the roots modulo modulo q by using the Chinese remainder theorem for each 
uh, Peter Lewis. Okay, so the question we were asking was, is this, does this have anything to do with uh, polynomials or is it just a general feature of the Chinese remainder theorem? And what I'm going to explain to you is that this is a very, very general feature of the Chinese remainder theorem. It's going to mix anything that you want. Okay, so here's the setup. Suppose for each prime power p to the v, I give you a set of residue classes mod p to the v. Now, so that's my set a p to the v. And uh, the cardinality of this set I'm going to denote by rho of p to the v. And it's conceivable that the set that I give you is just the empty set. So that's, for example, in the case of quadratic congruences, uh, if your prime was three mod four, I don't give you any residue classes at all. So it could be that this rho of p to the, p to the v is, uh, is just zero for some p to the v or many primes p to the v. I have written prime powers here. The theorem holds for prime powers, but if you want, you should just think of just primes. The prime, prime squares and the prime cubes are not relevant at all. So now you use these sets mod p to the v and the Chinese remainder theorem to get a set of residue classes aq for every modulus q. So in other words, you put a residue class A mod q in your set, if and only if, if you take any uh, prime power that exactly divides q, the residue class restricted to mod p to the v lies in, your, in the set that you're given A p to the v. Okay, so these sets, uh, the cardinality of these sets is given by a multiplicative function rho of q, Rho of Q is just a product of all the rho of P to the V's. And the question you can ask is, well, suppose I gave, I started out with some sets de defined on prime powers and I extend them to all composite moduli in this way. And then I form for each composite modulus, I look at the fraction A over Q, A being in this set, A sub Q. And if I take all these fractions, do they get equidistributed modulo one? Okay, so I hope the problem is, uh, is clear. Now, if you start thinking about this problem, you can see that uh, there are some limitations on what you, can, what you can expect. Well, one limitation would be that maybe I don't give you any residue classes mod P at all. So for every prime P, I give you no residue classes, and then there's no equidistribution to consider. So surely you must want to give some residue classes for let's say a positive density of primes. The, so that's uh, kind of what I, what I was just saying. So if you let the moduli Q that have at least, for which you give at least one residue class modulo Q, you want that set to be kind of big, otherwise you're not gonna be able to say much. And I'm gonna make the standing assumption that at least a positive density of primes, I give you at least one residue class. So for example, for any uh, roots of a, of a polynomial congruence, this would be true because for a positive density of primes, your polynomial would split in the, in the appropriate number field and therefore you would have at least one root. This assumption one can see will actually guarantee that if you look at the number of, number of moduli up to X that have at least uh, one residue class being given, that kind of grows a little bit. It grows like x over log x times the product of the primes uh, in for which you give me at least one residue class of one plus one over q. So, and this will be like some power of log x. So, so you're thinking of a set which has about x over log x to some power, and the power is uh, some quantity which is uh, uh, which is uh, it's more dense than the set of primes. So it has x over log x to the alpha for some alpha less than one. Okay, now that's not enough because suppose I just gave you for every prime P, I gave you one residue class. Then for every composite number Q, I would have given you one residue class as well. And that's a problem because if you just have one residue class for every composite number, it doesn't make sense to think about equidistribution of those. So for example, for every prime P, I could give you the residue class one mod P. And then for every modulus Q, I would have given you the residue class one mod Q, and there's no equidistribution to talk about there. So the other thing that I must, uh, that I must have 
is that maybe for many, uh, many primes p, I should give you at least two residue classes. Okay, so that's the least amount of information that I need to give you in order to hope for equidistribution. So let me say what kind of equidistribution I'm looking for. So if I take uh, a modulus Q in my set for which I have at least one residue class that's being given, and I, these are delta masses of these fractions A over Q, taken mod one, and then I just look at the measure that I get of these row of Q points, and then I want to know if this, this measure delta Q is approximately the uniform measure, which I can measure by saying, I, or I can quantify by looking at the discrepancy of this measure, which is take any interval in uh, R mod Z, count how many points lie inside that interval, uh, at the frequency of points that lie in this interval minus the length of that interval and take the worst possible case of how big this can be. If the discrepancy is small, then I know that I'm getting close to equidistribution. So the kind of result that I want is to, is to show that for most moduli Q that lie in the set where I'm giving you at least one residue class modulo Q, the discrepancy tends to be small. And this can only be done if for most moduli Q, I'm going to give you at least two points or some growing number of points. If the number of points that I give you is bounded, then it doesn't make sense to talk about, uh, about equidistribution. And so, I must have at least two residue classes in AP for many, many primes P. So the theorem that we prove is that a very general fact that in fact, the assumption that a positive density of primes, you, I give you at least one residue class. And then on some reasonably large set, I give you at least two residue classes. That is enough to guarantee that almost all the time I get equidistribution. So in fact, for the primes that have at least two residue classes, I don't need to know that this happens on a positive density of primes. I only need to know that the sum of the reciprocals of the primes on this set is reasonably large. So I want this capital P to be something tending to infinity in order for the theorem to communicate some meaning. So if this capital P is, uh, is reasonably large, then what the theorem tells you is that if I take the, the, the average of the discrepancy over all moduli Q in this, uh, in this set, that tends to zero exponentially in P, like e to the minus P over six, okay? Or in other words, if I want the discrepancy to be smaller than, uh, than e to the minus P over 12, well, that's going to happen apart from a small number of exceptions. The exceptions are going to be the number of elements in my set multiplied by this e to the minus p over 12. Okay, so for most moduli q, I get equidistribution of these measures delta p. And this is the best kind of uh, uh, result that you could hope because you can imagine that, uh, that if I look at the elements in my, in my set that are not divisible by any prime for which p is, uh, rho p is at least two, well, the probability of not being divisible by one of these primes, for each prime, it might be like one minus one over P. You multiply all of those together. So that probability might be like E to the minus P approximately times the size of my set. So apart from this constant one sixth that I have here, this kind of a result would be best possible. So for E to the minus P times the number of elements in my set, I would get only one point in my set. And for that one point, I have no equidistribution and the discrepancy would just be equal to one on, on that set. Any questions so far? Okay. So this generalizes Hooley's uh, theorem because you could apply this to the setting of uh, roots of a polynomial congruence. But the, the, the formulation of our, uh, our formulation is a little bit different from what Hooley formulated. So what we are formulating is you take the roots of a polynomial congruence, for example, modulo Q, you form the measure of, uh, for every Q and you normalize that measure. So that this, this is uh, less than one in size. So normalized to be a, uh, a probability measure. And then you average that over all the moduli Q going up to X. What Hooley does is slightly different because he throws in all the points and then averages over all Q going up to, up to some point 
and then divide by the total number of points. Okay, so, so these are two different formulations. I think in the case of uh, roots of a polynomial congruence, it's not very hard to go from this one, from this formulation to, the, to that formulation. If you're looking at composite moduli, I think the formulation that we have may be a little bit more natural because it permits this very general result. But on the other hand, in the Hooley case, if, you're, if you want to throw all the points in together and then talk about equidistribution, you might actually get counterexamples. So here's a, a very funny kind of counterexample, which, uh, which you in some ways you shouldn't have. If I give you lots and lots of prime points for every, uh, uh, for every prime P, so I give you almost P over log P residue classes for each, uh, for each prime P, and then you use the Chinese remainder theorem on that, you should think that there are lots and lots of residue classes that I'm giving you for every modulus. So you should really have uh, a great deal of equidistribution. And our theorem would tell you that that actually happens. But paradoxically, you don't get it in the Hooley measure because what happens is that if you, if you have P over log P points in for, every prime, uh, for every prime P, if you have two primes, let's say both are of the same size, you would have like, uh, if Q is a product of two primes, you would have like Q over log Q squared points for a, for a modulus Q, whereas for a prime modulus Q, you have just Q, you have more points, you have Q over log Q points. So if you, if you take an example of this type, the primes can be arranged to dominate, and then you will get no equidistribution because on the primes, I could give you a very non-equidistributed set, and then you know, that will contaminate what, what you're doing in the Hooley situation. Okay. But if you, if you impose any other sensible restraint, like the row P's are bounded, or they don't grow very rapidly, then you can work just as well with Hooley's measure as with the measure that we, that we have. So once we have this general result, which works for, uh, the, uh, for basically any situation of residue classes arising from the Chinese remainder theorem, we also wanted to generalize it to uh, a higher dimensional setting and see what the analog of Hooley's theorem should be. And then also to make further uh, extensions like restricting the moduli to, have, to having a given number of prime factors. Obviously you can't expect to have a general theorem for primes because for primes I could just give you the first 10 moduli, you know, one to 10 mod P for every prime P and there's going to be no equidistribution. But you can ask if I do that for products of two primes or three primes, maybe already you can start to say something. Okay. So let me tell you the setup first in uh, n dimensions. So I'm going to give you now a set of residue classes in z mod pz to the n or z mod p to the vz to the n. So the same notation, it's a set of uh, row of p to the v residue classes in this set. And then extend it by the Chinese remainder theorem to a set aq in z mod qz to the n. Okay, and the same multiplicative function rho of q uh, as we saw before. And I'm going to have the same assumption that, uh, that the, the set of moduli on which I'm giving you at least one n-tuple is reasonably large. So in other words, for a positive density of primes, I'm going to say that, I'm go that these sets are not empty. And then I want to ask, can I guarantee that the corresponding measures, the n-dimensional measures in this case, when can I guarantee that these tend to equidistribution for almost all moduli Q? So in the case of one dimension, we had a very nice, uh, nice condition. You need at least two points uh, for a reasonable number of primes, and that was necessary and sufficient so you can ask what must be the necessary and sufficient condition here in order to get equidistribution for almost all moduli. So once again, I'm going to quantify equidistribution through discrepancy. And here it's going to be a box discrepancy. So I take a box, which is a product of intervals in R mod Z to the N, and I count how many uh, points in my set land inside the box, subtracted from the expected number, the volume of the box times uh, the times the row of Q, if you like. I've normalized it here. And if I can make this close to zero, 
then I'm saying that the measures uh, delta Q are getting equidistributed in n dimension. Now, what is an obstruction to equidistribution here? Well, first of all, there could be very many, very uh, few points, like in the one dimensional case, and that, that would be a problem. So I should have at least that on a large number of primes, I should, I should be giving you at least two residue classes. But there's one more obstruction that you could have. You could have some kind of fixed hyperplane, for example, the sum of these coordinates adding up to one modulo p. And maybe your points in AP always lie inside this fixed hyperplane. And then if you use the Chinese tomato theorem, you're always going to land inside a fixed hyperplane uh, in AQ is going to land inside a fixed hyperplane. And then there will be no equidistribution in R mod Z to the M. You can only hope for equidistribution within that hyperplane. Okay. So in the one dimensional case, your hyperplane is just going to be uh, points in, R, in uh, Z mod PZ. And so what the condition that we assumed was that for many primes P, you have at least two points so that the two points are not all landing up in one hyperplane, which is just being one point. So the corresponding condition in the, in the n-dimensional case is that I'm going to take my set AP I'm going to take my set AP and intersect it with any affine hyperplane H, and then take the maximum number of points in this intersection over all possible non-degenerate hyperplanes. Okay. What I would like is that this quantity lambda P should be a little bit smaller than rho of P for many primes P, and then I would like to say that I get equidistribution in that situation. So in the one dimensional setting, these hyperplanes just correspond to points, a single point, and the intersection of a single point with my set AP, well, the maximum number of uh, elements that I can have is just one. And so the condition was simply that for some large number of primes, I gave you more than one point. So in, this, in the n dimensional setting, any n points can be made, in, made to lie inside a hyperplane. But if I gave you n plus one points in, in uh, general position, those will presumably not lie in any fixed hyperplane. So you could imagine that in general position, if I gave you n plus one points modulo p for every prime p, then that should be enough to guarantee some kind of equidistribution. Okay. So here's the, the theorem for, for n dimensions. The, in the one dimensional case, I summed over all uh, primes p, uh, the sum of the reciprocals of the primes p, where rho of p was at least two. So here I'm going to sum the reciprocals of the primes weighted by this quantity, one minus lambda p over rho p. Lambda p is the maximum number of points in the hyperplane. Rho p is the total number of points that I give you modulo p. So if, if I'm giving you somewhat more number of points in, inside, AP, inside the mod p, than the number of points that can lie inside a hyperplane, then this quantity should be large. Okay. And once this quantity gets large, then I get equidistribution for almost all moduli in, in this set. For almost all moduli in this set, I can see that the discrepancy is going to be small. Okay. So we can do a bit more than that. So, uh, so, so far I've told you how to generalize Hooley's theorem just in, term, just in terms of the Chinese remainder theorem, both in one dimensions and in higher dimensions. But you can also do uh, a bit more. You can restrict the moduli on which you want to study equidistribution to having a given number of prime factors. Now, obviously one would love to have a result of this type with k equals one, actually getting equidistribution on the primes but that's not meaningful in the general context because for a prime P, I could just give you the first few residue classes modulo P. Well, even if you have K being a fixed number, it could be problematic because imagine the one dimensional situation and I give you two residue classes for each prime P. And even if you have a, a number with 10 prime factors, I'm only giving you 
about a thousand residue classes modulo, modulo that number. And those thousand residue classes, again, it doesn't make sense to talk about equidistribution. So the, the, the minimal kind of condition that you would need is that, uh, that maybe this K should be growing in such a way that for a typical modulus Q with K prime factors, you get a growing number of points in your set. And what this result is telling you is that you can actually kind of guarantee that if you make a slightly stronger assumption on how uh, your rho p deviates from the maximum number of points lying inside a hyperplane. So to read this condition, imagine that you have a positive density of primes on which I'm giving you, let's say twice as many residue classes modulo uh, prime p uh, as the maximum number that can lie inside a hyperplane. Let's say rho p is at least twice lambda of p, and that happens on a positive density of primes, then this kind of condition would be satisfied. Okay. So if that condition is satisfied, so if I'm giving you a lot of primes on which I'm avoiding any fixed hyperplane, then the, the discrepancy when restricted to numbers with exactly k prime factors, so this is k prime factors, uh, let's say k distinct prime factors, just to be clear. If I restrict it to that, I get a bound, which is like, this is a small power of log that I'm saving. And what I'm saying, saving here is e to the minus k times whatever delta that I give you here. So in other words, if on a positive density of primes, I'm giving you uh, uh, that, uh, that I'm substantially avoiding some hyperplanes, then as soon as this k starts getting, going off to infinity, I start getting equidistribution. And k going off to infinity is the weakest condition that I can impose while needing that a of q is kind of growing as, uh, as q grows. Okay. So if you want to think about just the situation of uh, the, in the one dimensional case, uh, say for roots of a polynomial, uh, for roots of a polynomial, we would have rho of p is at least two for a positive density of primes. And what this says is that if you restrict to moduli that have at least k prime factors and k just goes to infinity, however slowly, then you're going to get equidistribution on when you restrict to those moduli. And you cannot have equidistribution if k is just a bounded number. So this result is best possible in terms of uh, how small k has to be in order to get the result. It is not optimal in terms of how large we can take k, uh, but any number has typically about log log x prime factors. Even the moduli in this set have usually about some constant times log log x prime factors. And this is substantially more than that. So this is larger than any power of log log x. I think that the result should be true, even if you have k having like a power of log x number of prime factors, but that's a, that's a situation that we haven't explored in the way this paper. If I make an even stronger assumption than what I had before, if I assume that for every prime p, I'm giving you a lot more residue classes mod p than lie inside any fixed hyperplane, so, so this guy is less than some small number delta times the sum of the reciprocals of the primes in this set. If I can arrange that, then I start getting equidistribution even for numbers with two prime factors. So if k is two, this is some power delta to the one tenth. If delta is suitably small, then it's telling you that on numbers with two prime factors, I'm starting to already get equidistribution. So again, if you look at the one dimensional situation, you can imagine that for every prime p that I give you uh, log, 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 log p residue classes. And then that's enough to guarantee that on numbers with two prime factors, I get equidistributions on these, of, of these sets for a typical number with two prime factors. Okay. So I should also tell you here that a typical number with two prime factors looks like one very big prime and one, one very small prime. And that's kind of important in, in, our, in, our, in this setting. These are not like uh, the numbers with two prime factors that you would get out of the sieve. With the sieve, you might expect that you're, you are focusing on numbers with two prime factors where both of them say, both the primes lie between say, x to the one tenth and x to the nine tenth. 
those are not the numbers that I'm looking at. Those, the, num the number of elements of that form is like a constant times x over log x. The actual number of integers with two prime factors is like x over log x times a log log x, and that log log is kind of important. The log log comes from the fact that a number with two prime factors will have one huge prime factor and one tiny prime factor. And those are the numbers that are captured in this here. Okay. So let me give you some applications of these theorems. So the most natural applications still revolve around uh, polynomials and roots of polynomials. So I could start with an irreducible polynomial of degree D as in Hooley's theorem. I can now give you a, a higher dimensional version of his theorem. Instead of just looking at the distribution of A modulo P, suppose I look at the distribution of the tuple A, A squared, all the way up to A to the D minus one. Uh, consider that tuple in Z mod PZ to the D minus one, and then extend that by the Chinese remainder theorem. Okay. If you take a hyperplane and intersect intersected with points of this type, say just points of the form uh, t, t squared, t cubed up to t, up to t to the d minus one, any hyperplane can intersect this set in only d minus one points because you're looking at the roots of a polynomial of degree d minus one and the roots of a polynomial of degree d minus one uh, modulo p, it can have only d minus one solution. Now, if I give you any polynomial, uh, f, irreducible polynomial of degree d, there is a positive density of primes on which I have these solutions. These are the primes that are completely split in the, in, the, in the number field. And then for those primes, the I am not going to concentrate on any fixed hyperplane. I'm going to get out of any fixed hyperplane, which means that the theorem that, I, that I've been describing to you holds, and I get equidistribution of these sets for almost all moduli key. And this was recently conjectured by Hushovsky for, of course, the interesting case when the moduli are all just primes. He conjectured that if you average over all uh, primes P as well, you get equidistribution of these sets. That's, of course, still open, but you can, you can do the version of it for all, all moduli Q rather than prime moduli Q. You can make extensions of uh, uh, of roots of polynomials, you can restrict the moduli that you consider to just be moduli having prime factors in some subsets, so long as those subsets are kind of nice. For example, we could restrict the subsets to be uh, all the primes that are one mod four, and then you'd be able to get some theorem, which means that even if you can't get moduli Q that are primes, for example, you can get moduli that are sums of two squares, if you, and get equidistribution very generally in moduli that are sums of two squares. You can study roots of uh, polynomials where the roots are, are, let's say, asked to be quadratic residues modulo p. And that, again, you would be able to handle by, by this method. Then after we wrote this paper, uh, we got some feedback from, uh, from some people. So Krizan and Pollack, uh, Paul Pollack kindly pointed out that they had studied the smallest root setting of a polynomial modulo q and shown that the smallest root must be smaller. So let's say take the root to lie between zero and, and q, and they could make it smaller than q log q to some negative power for, uh, for many moduli q, almost all moduli q. And this is contained in the theorem that I've been describing, because if I tell you that the discrepancy is small, I can take a very small initial interval, and then that would all, you would also know that the right number of points inside, lie inside that small interval. Keith Brown pointed out to us uh, another application of this result. You could take any irreducible form uh, in two variables, f, x, y, and then you could look at the roots of this form modulo, modulo p, and then get, get by the Chinese remainder theorem the roots modulo q, and those sets of points x, y, mod q, those get equidistributed for a typical modulus q. And I think this might have some interesting applications, uh, which, uh, which would be very nice. Another kind of uh, thing you could fit into this model is uh, uh, you could look at, uh, at say two plane curves. So here are two examples of some plane curves. You could look at the intersection points of these plane curves modulo P for a proportion of primes you would get uh, several intersection points. 
I don't know, uh, you, you'd have to discount the points at infinity and just look at the points at, uh, uh, at the, the points, uh, the, the, the finite points. And then so long as those points don't all lie inside certain lines, you would get equidistribution. And so this is a situation in which you can make the theorem work in two dimensions. So there's a number of applications of this type that you can, that you can imagine. I'm gonna give you a very weird application which is, uh, which is kind of fun. There are some very strange objects called pseudopolynomials. And these pseudopolynomials were studied by Hall and Ruja, uh, maybe in the 70s or early 80s. So what's a pseudopolynomial? We, so we've been talking about polynomials because polynomials have the interesting uh, feature that if I look at f of n modulo, modulo p or modulo q, it only depends upon n modulo p or n modulo q. A pseudopolynomial is a general function from n to z which has the same property that, that if you take, if a is congruent to b uh, modulo some number p, then f of a is also congruent to f of b. Or in other words, a minus b always divides f of a minus f of b for any numbers a and b with a not equal to b. So polynomials are pseudopolynomials, but there are uncountably many pseudopolynomials. It's kind of fun to think of pseudopolynomials. So it turns out that if you take e times n factorial, then and you look at its integer part, that ends up being a pseudopolynomial. That's an example of Hall. Another example that's a pseudopolynomial, well, you don't have to just look at e times n factorial, you could look at n factorial divided by e, which is count, counting derangements. So you, you have to fix the sign of that, but if you take minus one to the n times the number of derangements in SN, that gives you an example of a pseudopolynomial as well. So now you could study, admittedly a slightly exotic object, you could study the roots of a pseudopolynomial modulo any number, any prime P or modulo any composite number Q. So in other words, you want to look at what are the primes that divide values of a pseudopolynomial. Now this seems very hard to say anything about. So if, for example, if I look at either the number of derangements or E times n factorial, it seems like if I reduce these modulo a prime P, they look like random numbers. So for every prime P, a proportion of like one over E of, uh, of the moduli for every prime P will be roots of this pseudopolynomial. But there's no way in which I can understand what roots of a pseudopolynomial are or make anything, anything of that type precise. So if that's true, then our theorem would apply to the setting and tell you equidistribution of those roots also modulo a composite number. But there is one amusing example in which you can actually say that there are uh, two roots, which is what I need to make the equidistribution theorem work, which is I don't look at derangements, but I look at numbers, at, I look at permutations in SN that have exactly one fixed point. So this is very, very closely related to the number of derangements. It's kind of the derangements plus or minus one. Okay. And that has, a, that has the nice property that I can find kind of two trivial roots of this for every, prime, every uh, modulus P. And then the theorem applies to this, applies to the setting, even though I don't know how to count how many roots it has uh, for any prime P. It's enough that it has two roots for every prime P. And, and therefore I would be able to show that the roots of this modulo composite number Q are equidistributed. Okay. So lastly, I want to say something about uh, the proofs of these results. Uh, the proofs really in some way go back to the ideas that Huli had and, uh, and what is uh, mixing, and you will see that what's mixing everything up is, uh, is a kind of twisted multiplicativity which falls out of the Chinese remainder theorem. So in order to prove equidistribution, I have to study uh, vile sums attached to a general modulus Q or normalized vile sums in this case. So I give you a point H1 to Hn, and then I want to study the vile sums, let's say if I'm looking at the n-dimensional setting, I have to look at the vile sums. I have these points in my set AQ, and then this is just uh, uh, the dot product H1, X1 up to H, H and Xn. If I can show that these vile sums are small, then I'd be able to plug that into uh, ways of bounding the discrepancy in terms of the vile sums. This is just vile equidistribution theorem, 
and then show that that gets me uh, equity distribution of the for almost all moduli. So what does the Chinese remainder theorem tell me? Uh, if I can factor the modulus Q as Q1 times Q2, where Q1 and Q2 are co-prime, then the vial sum for Q1, Q2 has a twisted multiplicativity in terms of the vial sum for Q2 and the vial sum for Q1. It doesn't just factor, which would be kind of a disaster, but you get H times uh, the multiplicative inverse of Q1 here and the multiplicative inverse of Q2 modulo Q1. And this is just the Chinese remainder theorem. You have to look at the denominator here of Q1, Q2. The Chinese remainder theorem just says that one over Q1, Q2 modulo one is the inverse of Q2 divided by Q1 plus the inverse of Q1 divided by Q2. You just cross multiply and add, and that's the Chinese remainder theorem. So, so how does one use this? Suppose I have a general modulus Q and I'm going to factor this as a product of uh, two numbers R and S. Uh, R is going to stand for rough numbers and S is going to stand for smooth numbers. So the number R is only going to have prime factors, all of which are bigger than some number Z. So you should think of Z as being some small power of X. What it is, I, since I'm not gonna give so many details, doesn't really matter. It just depends upon uh, the context of whatever result that I'm proving some power of X that's going off to zero. So R is going to have all prime factors that are bigger than Z. S is going to have all prime factors smaller than Z. Now, typically uh, there are not so many smooth numbers. So the smooth part is going to be some probably small number. So S might be a number which only goes up to like X to the one third and the rough part will be usually a big number. So like, uh, uh, a lot of numbers, like 70% of the numbers will have a prime factor which is bigger than square root of X. So the rough part will tend to be reasonably large most of the time. So if I want to have a sum over uh, the vial sums to the modulus Q, if I factor Q as R times S, the vial sums factor as we've seen in terms of a vial sum modulo S and a vial sum modulo R. For the vial sum modulo R, these are normalized vial sums. That's a trivial bound that the vial sum modulo R, I'm just going to replace it by one. Okay, notice also that I, I'm not going to look for any cancellation in, this, in, the, in the signs or the phases of these vial sums. I'm just going to put absolute values and just show that the vial sums, uh, even in size, tend to be small for a general modulus Q. So the vial sums modulo R are just taken away. For the vial sums modulo S, I want to say that there's some mixing going on, which is going to give me a slightly better result. I can save something over the trivial bound. Okay, why is that true? If I fix the smooth part S, which I kind of told you, you should think of as being slightly small, let's say smaller than X to the one third or so, then there are a lot of values, a lot of rough numbers R to play with. And let's say I, I kind of, uh, force my, I count the rough numbers R that lie in a fixed arithmetic progression modulo S. I can use the sieve to bound how many numbers I have uh, in each progression of this type. I won't have an asymptotic formula for the number of such numbers, but the upper bound sieve will produce for me that the, apart from constants, I get the right number, of, uh, right number of rough values S inside any progressions modulo, modulo S. I won't use here the fact that S is smaller than something like X to the one third. So R goes up to X to the two thirds. There are plenty of values of R to, to play with and the sieve works pretty easily to give you some bound of this type. Okay, so if I now split in this expression R into progressions modulo S, what I have is for each progression R modulo S, so say that R is actually the inverse of A modulo S, I get uh, the vial sum at h times a, and then the number of values of s, I've taken this out as just being bounded by one, and the number of values of r, I get basically, apart from constants, I get the right estimate on that by the sieve. So instead of having one vial sum to one modulus wh uh, with s, I get this average over all the, in, over all the progressions modulo s of these vial sums. So this is the, this is what I, what the Chinese remainder theorem wins, and that's the source of the mixing uh, that you see in these theorems. 
Now, how do I bound uh, this average of while sums? Well, I can just use Cauchy-Schwarz to bound that. The trivial bound is one, and what, all I'm trying to get is something that improves upon the trivial bound. And then if S has more and more prime factors, I get a better and better improvement for a modulus uh, S with lots of prime factors. So I want to improve my bound on, on vial sums by just using Cauchy-Schwarz. So I bound the L1 norm by the L2 norm, which gives me this. For the L2 norm, I can expand this out by Parseval. So the vial sums are normalized, so I get this one over rho s squared. The, this had a one over rho s in, in the definition of the vial sum. And then the exponential sum was a sum over x1 and x2 lying inside my set. And what is Parseval giving me? If I sum over all the moduli a modulo s, I want the congruence uh, h times x1 must be the same as h times x2 modulo s. I'm going to count the number of solutions to this congruence. Now imagine that x1 is fixed. If I fix x1, then how many choices do I have for x2? Well, those are the points that lie on a hyperplane. The hyperplane being h times h dot x2 is equal to whatever this number h dot x1 is. Let's call it a. So if I fix x1, the maximum number of solutions that I have for x2 is exactly my, the definition of this number lambda of x, which is the maximum number of points that I have in my set uh, intersected with any affine hyperplane. Okay, so let's plug that back in here. The number of choices that I have for x1 is just uh, the total number of points in my set rho of s. If I fix x1, then the number of choices that I have for x2 is just the maximum number of points in the intersection of the hyperplane, this is lambda of s. All of this is divided by rho of s squared, which is my normalization in my vial sum. And so what I have saved over the trivial bound of one is this ratio of the maximum number of points inside any hyperplane divided by the total number of points in my set uh, A of S. And this is the saving that kind of uh, uh, filters through and makes all the other theorems that I stated work. Okay, that's all I wanted to say on this. Thank you very much. Let's all try uh, unmuting and clapping. Does anybody have any questions? So where does the one sixth come from? Oh, you mean in the first theorem? Yeah. Uh, Okay, I don't think we paid any attention to the constant, so I can't tell okay. you even, you know. So like, uh, there are many things that I, I kind of didn't mention, which is like in this, uh, in this kind of uh, uh, result, you would want to say that, well, what happens if the smooth part, like I said that you should think of the smooth part as being smaller than like X to the one third. So there's like mm -hmm. a third there, for example, you could see. So, so you would have to, and you'd have to handle the case where the smooth part is large, and throw that off and say that you don't get much of a much of an error in doing that. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, like another thing is that uh, if you use Cauchy Schwartz here, you take this lambda s over rho s and then you have to take the square root of that. So, and then I kind of uh, simplified life a bit by instead of having one minus square root of lambda s over, over rho s, you can replace it by one minus lambda s over rho s. So little places here and there where there's some loss. I don't know if you could get the ideal exponent this way, probably not, but yeah. Does anybody else have a question? Uh, so we've got a raised hand. Uh, somebody who raised a hand, I think, I don't know if yeah. they... If you have a question, feel free to just unmute yourself if you can. Uh, sorry, I've tried unmuting everyone. Um, if I think you should be able to unmute yourself. So, 
it's a question from Sari, who asks in the chat, um, he was wondering what happened in the max over B if that was taken before averaging over Q? Sound, you're muted. Okay, sorry. Uh, so what I was saying was that I only focused on uh, on uh, on the vial sums, but you could use Erdős Turan to say that uh, that you can bound the discrepancy of any measure by by basically uh, the sum of something like one over h times the vial sums. Uh, summed over all h, let's say. Okay, so maybe going up to some point. So this is the usual erdos turan type inequality that if you if you know that the vial sums are small up to some point h, then you can approximate uh, any indicator function up to up to with some error, and therefore you can count how many things lie inside a box. So so the maximum was already taken out. Maximum over b was taken out at this stage because I'm always working with these discrepancies, and now I only have to bound the absolute value of these vial sums. Okay, so this is once again one place where, if I were if I were trying to give a proof by a sum over W H Q and then and then trying to exploit cancellation in the science of this, then you would have a problem because I'm not taking the maximum will be before doing this. But in fact, I'm only as I'm as I was explaining, I'm only uh, happy to bound even with this uh, uh, maximum inside absolute values. So you can just plug that straight into Erdős Turan and then get something out. Does that answer your question, Sari? Okay. Does anybody else have a question for sound? So I might, I might ask a question actually. Um, I was wondering if, what if you knew even more? So what if you knew, for instance, that um, your, the points mod each prime weren't trapped, you know, you worried about them being trapped in a hyperplane, but what if they, if you knew they weren't trapped in a quadratic hypersurface or, you know, is there anything more you could say? We haven't thought about it. It doesn't come up uh, in this situation because as I explained in this uh, last thing with, uh, uh, with Parseval, is the only place where we are where the hyperplane condition comes in, and I don't know, you know, maybe there's some other statistic that one can imagine trying to play around with where this would come in. I don't know. Maybe well, maybe you could study higher moments of W and then plug it in, but uh, uh, I'm not sure how much it would improve what one has. Yeah. Okay, does anybody else have a question? If nobody else has a question, uh, that's all. Thanks, Sound, again.